Hey YouTube, this is David Staples coming back to you with another video with some practice questions for the Cisco CCNA and CCENT. Uh, this covers the ICND-1, which is the 100-105 exam, and the 200-105 or ICND-2 exam. If you like these questions, I hope you'll consider clicking on that subscribe button down below, and feel free to leave a comment with any questions that you might have. In the meantime, let's get started. All right, so we're going to go ahead and get started with question number one here. Again, these are for the Cisco CCNA or CCENT uh, exams, depending upon which one you're on. Uh, if you're looking at taking the combined exam, the 200-125, uh, they're certainly relevant for that type of exam as well. So before we get started, let me just tell you a little bit about how I do my practice questions here. Essentially, I'm going to give you 10 seconds for every question. If you need to click on the pause button, feel free to go ahead and hit pause so that you've got a little extra time to read it and look through the answers. And then, of course, when you're ready to, to choose your answer, go ahead and click on play. And after that 10 second timer has elapsed, it will actually show you the answer on the screen. And I'll go through and discuss why that's the right answer. I'm not just gonna give you the answers here, but we need to understand why it's the right answer, right? So, so let's go ahead and get started with question number one. So question number one, router R1 does not appear to be receiving routes from router R2 via OSPF. Which of the following could be a potential reason why? Well, we know that when we're setting up an OSPF routing protocol, that we actually need to have our hello and dead timers actually match on those routers, right? So if they don't match, then you'll actually get a hello or dead timer mismatch. They won't actually form a neighbor connection, uh, thus they won't actually be updating their routes. So question number two, switch SW1 is configured with VLANs 15, 30, and 40, in addition to the native VLAN, which is using the default VLAN ID. If switch one receives an untagged packet, what will happen to that packet? Well, we know that the native VLAN by default is going to be VLAN 1, right? And whenever a switch actually receives a packet that is not tagged, it assumes that it's for the native VLAN. So it will actually forward it out any interfaces that are associated with VLAN 1 or that native VLAN. So of course, the option that we're going to see here that matches that is going to be C. The packet will be sent only on the native VLAN interfaces. The packet will not be dropped. It's not going to be broadcast out all the interfaces. And the switch isn't going to be responding with a destination unreachable message either. So question number three, Simon sees that router R6 has learned multiple routes to another network. When examining the output of the command show IP route, he sees that the currently active route has the letter D beside it for the source of where it learned the route. How did R6 learn this route? Well, we know that when we're looking at the results of a routing table, basically a show IP route command, that it will actually show us a uh, O for OSPF, it will show us a R for RIP, but for EIGRP, it actually shows us a D. So the D in this example means that we learned the route via EIGRP. All right, so let's move on to question number four. So it's definitely a very good idea to know your administrative distances for the Cisco CCNA or CCENT exams, whether it's the 100-105, the 200-105, or the 200-125. The uh, they were all going to potentially reference an administrative distance at some point. So uh, knowing the administrative distances is a very good idea. So the administrative distance for OSPF by default uh, is going to be 110. We know that 90, of course, is going to be EIGRP. Uh, 110 is going to be our uh, OSPF, and then RIP is actually going to be 120 by default. And of course, those are the main three routing protocols that Cisco is going to focus on on these exams. So I uh, definitely want to make sure that you at least know those at the very minimum. So Gene is responsible for maintaining a network running on 802. running 802.1D on the switches. He then purchases a new switch capable of running 802.1W and configures it to use that standard. What will happen to this new switch? Well, 802.1D, of course, is our spanning tree protocol. 
And then of course, 802.1w is our rapid spanning tree protocol. Uh, they are actually compatible with each other. So of course the switch will actually work normally. It's not going to create a new network segment. It's not going to downgrade the rapid spanning tree switch down to use the standard spanning tree protocol. And it's not going to display any sort of an error message that they're not compatible either. So this will actually work normally. This is going to be A. So question number six. So question number six, Wilbur needs to create a subnet that will be able to accommodate up to 500 hosts for a new branch office. Which of the following is a likely network that he might create? Well, we know that when we've got a slash 24, that we've got 256 total IP addresses. And if we take one for our network ID and one for our broadcast ID, then that means that we can put 254 hosts on that network, right? So we can automatically eliminate a slash 24. We know that a slash 25 is going to give us even fewer hosts per subnet, correct? So a slash 23, of course, is our only option here. And of course, a slash 23 would actually give us a total of 512 IP addresses, which would mean that I can put 510 hosts on every subnet. So this is going to be B. So question number seven, after a bunch of configuration changes, Tony runs the command on switch SW6, copy startup dash config space running dash config, and then runs a reload command. What's the result of his actions? Well, we know that when we copy the startup config to the running config, that you're actually overriding the running configuration that's in RAM right now, right? So essentially what has happened is that any changes that we have just made have all been lost if we did not actually do a copy running config to startup config first. Uh, and of course, why you'd run a copy running config to startup config and then back to running config, there's really no reasonable explanation for something like that, right? So of course the correct command would be copy space running dash config space startup dash config. Or of course you can abbreviate these with using the words run and start. So you could say copy run space start. And of course that would work just as well. So this is going to be B. The switch will reboot, but none of his new changes will be active. And of course, the switch reboots because we issued that reload command, right? So let's move on to question number eight. So question number eight, which of the following could be used to block inbound ICMP traffic? Well, we know that TACX Plus and DHCP v6 have nothing to do with really blocking traffic, right? And we also know that our standard access control list allows us to filter traffic based on source IP addresses. So of course, if I actually wanted to block by port or block by other types of options here, I could use an extended access control list to be able to go ahead and perform that type of filtering. So question number nine, which command must be in the running config in order for IPv6 routing to occur? Well, this is actually going to be D, IPv6, and then space, and then unicast dash routing. This will actually enable our router for IPv6. So Bobo has configured two routers with EIGRP named R1 and R2. R1 is configured with hello hold timers of 10 and 20, and R2 is configured with hello hold timers of 30, 90. What will be the result of this configuration? Well, we know that with OSPF, as we talked about earlier, that the hello and dead timers have to match, right? Well, EIGRP works a little bit differently in that it uses hello and hold timers. So essentially, when it receives a hello packet, it's okay that the other router doesn't necessarily have a configuration that matches those exact timers. But if it doesn't receive another message within the allotted time set by its hold timer, then of course it's going to assume that that route has gone down. So essentially what's going to happen here is that router two with its hello hold timers of 3090 is going to send its hello packet every 30 seconds. Router one of course is saying, if I don't receive a packet at least every 20 seconds, I'm going to assume that the route's offline. 
So it'll receive a hello from router two and it'll say, oh, I've got a route to router two. Let me go ahead and activate that route. And then of course, 20 seconds later, it's going to say, okay, well, I haven't received a hello within the allotted amount of time. So I'm going to go ahead and assume the route's down. Let's turn it back off. Then of course, when router two hits its 30 second hello again, it will go ahead and send another hello out. And in which case, R1 will say, oh, you're back up. Okay, wonderful. Let's go ahead and reestablish this connection. 20 seconds later, it's going to drop back offline because of course it hasn't received another hello within that 20 second hold period that it's configured for. So again, I hope you've enjoyed these practice questions for the Cisco CCNA and CCENT exams. And feel free to show me a little love by clicking on that little subscribe button down below. If you've got any questions, feel free to leave those down in the comments below. I have to answer any questions that you might have. And uh, be sure to click on that like button as well. If you haven't checked out the rest of my Cisco playlist, feel free to go check those out or any other certifications that I might have videos for. And since you guys have been showing me some love here on these videos with subscribing and liking and everything, I'll go ahead and keep on working on putting some more of these out. So I will see you guys very soon. You guys take care. Thanks for tuning in.